thanks uh, for having me here today. Um, I didn't make the, uh, the last workshop that Richard ran in the Coopers, uh, but I did actually, it was part of the Paru workshop, uh, I think it was 16 years ago. It's hard to believe, isn't it? Um, look, it's a pleasure to be able to talk to you today about this. Um, we value the environment, whether we choose to deliberately or not. If we don't do it, we do it implicitly, right? It happens. The choices we make suggest the values we have for the environment. What I want to talk to you today about is um, how economists, that special breed of people, think about uh, our values, what, the, what it means to them, how we go about valuing it, and what might be some of the values for the rivers and wetlands uh, in this basin. Okay, It's not a basin I know a lot about. Most of my work's been in the Murray-Darling Basin, but we can learn a lot from the work that's been done there about what's relevant here. First of all, let's talk about these use and non-use values. So there are two types of values for the economist. Okay? The first type is use values. That's the values from using a good, but it can be using it directly, or it can actually be indirect. So direct use is some, you know, like recreation of the locals and tourism. Amenity value is the, the, the enjoyment you get from living near something that's, that's nice, right? environmentally, commercial fishing, and obviously for a lot of people in this room, beneficial flooding and grazing. Indirect use, though, also occurs. So, you know, if Richard's water birds grow and healthy, you know, then there's a locust plague. They might eat all the locusts, which benefits all the farmers, right? And others. Um, groundwater recharge. Uh, wetlands purify water, drinking water. So there are, there are indirect use benefits, sometimes called ecosystem service values. Though ecosystem service values can also include the direct use values as well. Then there are what we call non-use values, and it turns out with things particularly like uh, lake air, these are very important. These are values associated with a good apart from any direct or indirect use. So you might be living in Brisbane or Sydney, you might really care about the lake air basin or lake air, but you're never going to go there. You're never going to go and see it. It's, it's really important to you nonetheless, and that's, we call that often an existence value, same as non-use value. And you can have a whole lot of reasons for valuing that. You might simply value its existence, you might care about it for your kids, you might care about it for other people, altruism. You might just feel that it's your responsibility to look after it, or you might have some spiritual motive. Either way, you value it. So for the economist, total economic value are those two things put together. And for remote wetlands like Lake Eyre, those non-use values are likely to dominate because there's not many people out here. Okay, so there can't be that much use value because there are not you know, large numbers of people tend to equate to a larger use value. So how do the economists estimate economic values for wetlands that can be used in a cost-benefit analysis to figure out whether a development should go ahead? Well, there are about three different approaches, um, or three main types of approach. The first is market-based techniques, and we use these for estimating use and indirect use values. There are productivity approaches where you can look at, you know, such things as the value of changing, uh, value of the change in the value of grazing from, you know, less water. We could do something like a replacement or damage cost, which is where, well, if, you know, a wetland is damaged and it's purifying water, well, then we might have to uh, come up with another water source. We might have to desalinate or something like that. And so that gives us an estimate of the cost. Then there are what we call revealed preference techniques. And these are, again, for estimating use values. One of these is the travel cost approach, which is often used for estimating recreation or use value. So generally speaking, um, we can f figure out something about the recreation value that people have for something by how much they're prepared to spend getting there in terms of their travel cost and time. And we know that as that cost goes up, people tend to visit a little less, right? And so you find that as you go further or way you get less visitation and that allows us to map out a demand curve and understand recreation value. Hedonic pricing is another one. There you look at differences in property prices when you have something that's environmentally rich and compare that to something that's environmentally poor, you know, and as the quality goes down that affects house prices or even farm property prices. Quite a lot of work's done on that as well. That tells us a lot about the value. And then there's this last class of techniques. Don't worry, we've finished the theory. This is the last theory slide. I'll give you some of the evidence in just a moment. So we have this last class of techniques called state of preference techniques. And the main technique here is called choice modeling. 
think of it like being at a car auction. You know, you sit there all day, and you see a lot of cars being sold, and if you spend enough time there, you'll suddenly figure out, well, how much do people pay for a newer car or a safer car, you know, or a trendier car, or a car that has five airbags rather than two. You just observe it. What we do here is we present people with a whole lot of choices about wetland health that improves the wetland that's defined in certain outcomes and that comes at a cost. We get people to make a lot of these choices like this and it tells us something about their value. So here we can see this is the River Murray and the Coorong, water bird breeding, fish, vegetation and water bird habitat. People could maintain the current situation, breeding isn't very often, not a lot of fish, vegetation half the original area and the Coorong is pretty bad, that's not going to cost you anything. Or you could improve the Coorong and the Murray, so we could have breeding every year, fish is up from 30 to 50 percent, vegetation from 50 to 7 percent, the Coorong is still bad and it'll cost you 125 bucks for 10 years. We show people a lot of alternatives, different ones, we mix them up, and then we can start to figure out how much things val people value things, much like sitting at the car auction. Okay, <clears throat> so valuing changes in wetland health and lake air and the, the various rivers that, that flow into it. We've got a few challenges. Uh, no previous studies have actually been done in this area, it's a bit of a challenge. Um, relatively few people live nearby, so there's limited indirect use values. One nice thing is, is that Lake Air is a unique and iconic system, so of all the systems that I can think of, it's probably most like the Coorong, okay, in saltwater end of system. But we're going to need to rely on benefit transfer to try to value it, which is just reusing studies that are similar in another location because you haven't done an original one. So m myself and Dale Hatton McDonald, um, we, for the Murray-Darling Basin plan, we did a, a large synthesis report which brought together all of the existing literature on values that could be used for cost-benefit analysis of the basin plan. And we found 15 studies that had been done, so there's 1 to 15, that have been done in a range of locations in the Murray-Darling Basin. And you'll notice they're valuing things like recreation, vegetation, fish, water bird breeding and other species. And you know, you can just this table here tells you what's been valued and where. What we then did was, in this report, was we looked at what should be used where for valuing each of the different catchments. This was for the Murray-Darling Basin Plan. And um, you know, where a study had been done in a location, obviously it was the best bet, but sometimes we had to reuse studies elsewhere. And then what we did was we recommended aggregate values that could be used in a cost-benefit analysis. So how do you read something like this? Well, you'll notice here for the Bow and Darling, I can't really read that, but it's um, $3,600, uh, 3.6 million, so it's $1,000 there, $3.6 million for a 1% increase in healthy vegetation. Now, if there, if there was a 10% increase in healthy vegetation from the basin plan, we would times that value by 10. We'd add to that the, the change in fish population times the value and so on, add that all together, that gives us a value for the change in the bow and darling. Add the recreation value and any others that you have, and there's a value that can be included in the cost benefit analysis. Okay. Now we actually estimated separate values for the Coorong because it's not really a river, it's a bit different, um, and it's like Lake Air. Now the thing that we found was it actually has a really large value. This is an Im improvement from poor to good quality. But our estimate of value for that was 4.3 billion. Um, but it's a large improvement, obviously. Um, now, the Centre for Econ International Economics then did a cost-benefit analysis of the proposed basin plan, and they used our report. They didn't use another estimate as well, but they mostly relied on our report. They found that for the 3,000 gigalitre reallocation, that the non-use values were between about 3 and 5 billion. But if you had a larger reallocation and you included the value for the Coorong, it was closer to eight and a half billion. And the use values were 500 to 600 million. The costs for that 3,000 gigalitre reallocation were about one to four and a half billion, so a fair bit of uncertainty there. And for the 4,000 gigalitre reallocation, it was 1.3 to 7.3 billion. What about beneficial graze, uh, flooding for grazing? The CIE did look at a report by Arch Consulting that quite a few of you, I'm guessing, partly paid for. 
um, that of three farms on the Paru, the Warrego and the Darling River. They found that over 15 years flooding added 6.8 million in gross profit. But the CIE concluded at this stage we are not able to provide broad estimates of potential benefits in that cost-benefit analysis. Why? Because I needed to do it for each of the catchments. This was just three farms that had been looked at. There was no systematic analysis that could be included in the cost-benefit analysis. So arguably the graziers who benefit from flooding were not represented well in the political and economic debate because of a lack of data. CSIRO, I was part of this as well, did what they called their multiple benefits project. And they sought to do a much carefuler understanding of the economic value of it all. They looked at a 2,800 gigalitre reallocation, so a little less. They did a lot, much, lot more work in estimating use values. And they tried to understand much better how the extra water would lead to better environmental outcomes, which were then valued. So they looked at some other values that CIE didn't. One was carbon sequestration. Okay, so here you've got all the different catchments that they've uh, they looked at. And if you add that up, the value from carbon uh, sequestration was between about 126 million and about a billion dollars, right? Erosion prevention and soil fertility, a lot smaller, but they did figure that out. They then went and looked at a whole lot of other values. Um, Salinity, $3.1 million a year. That's for households. For agricultural costs, $29 million a year. If you want the uh, total value of that, you've got to times it by about 11 if you want the, to, uh, to get an aggregate value in, at one point in time. So about $300 million. A few others here. Property prices, they found some quite significant property prices, but tourism was a, a one they found a big difference in. They got about a value for tourism about two and a half times what the CIE did. They found it was worth a lot more than the CIE study. They also um, found the non-use values were probably a little bit higher but similar to CIE. So how do those sorts of values, you've got to remember to compare the, just the single river values rather than the catchment values, compare to the sorts of rivers you find in Queensland. And this is work from Abare and um, Condamine, the value, the gross value of irrigated agriculture is about 457 million a year. The border rivers in Queensland about 245 million dollars a year. Sounds a lot. But remember, this is the gross value of irrigated agriculture. You know, gross value does not equal profit. You've got to take your costs out. You know, it's not just what you sell it for. And the value of irrigation is crudely not just the profit that you get from irrigated agriculture. To understand the value of shifting to irrigation, it's the extra profit you get from irrigation minus the profit you get from if you were doing other things, right? So the profit you get is going to be a lot less than those figures, or the value is a lot less than those figures. But it's also likely to be relatively small in this region because there's no major dam, and from what I understand from Richard, there's not going to be a major dam. It's just not possible. So the irrigation is only ever going to be opportunistic. So the value you're going to get from irrigation is never going to be particularly high. But the costs you could get from environmental degradation are potentially very high. So what do you take from all of this? What are the takeaways? Well, first of all, we found in the Murray-Darling Basin that non-use values dominated, even when you had quite a lot of people. But there are some other key values, including carbon sequestration, changes in property prices and recreation values, and perhaps um, uh, salinity in agriculture. This is the really important point. The benefits for a 2,800 gigalitre reallocation that the CSIRO found were much larger than what was identified by the Centre for International Economics for a 3,000 gigalitre reallocation. CIE, three to about eight and a half billion. CSIRO, 6.2 to 11.5 billion. And still, there were a lot of values that CSIRO could not quantify. So what that tells us is that as we start to learn more, increasing knowledge, we find that the, the value of improving environmental quality or maintaining it is much higher than we previously thought. Okay. Non-use values are likely to be present and large for Lake Eyre given its iconic status. I suspect it's probably like the Coorong. Um, I suspect also there's likely to be fairly large recreation values. I think we're hearing a bit more about that tomorrow. But given the distances people are prepared to travel and the quantity of people that are prepared to do that, it suggests quite large values. And the thing is, that you know, the whole game here is not just about Lake Eyre, it's also about, you know, Cooper Creek, the Diamantina and Georgina Rivers and the other tributaries that are going to be affected. You've got to add all that together 
to get the cost of the decline in river and wetland health. I think there is a need to better understand uh, the economic value of beneficial flooding for grazing and how this changes with river diversions. Particularly not just how much it's worth, but how much it changes, the value changes as the water changes. And somebody said yesterday, it was Jeff, how important it is to be monitoring carefully what's going on. You know, the value of your enterprises, how many people are employed, where the water gets to and so on. I totally support that perspective. The value of irrigation is, I think, is likely to be relatively small compared to other catchments. There's no major storage dam is possible. But I think the cost of the community from environmental degradation are likely to be large from development. So if it does proceed, I, it's my expectation that there would be a significant loss in community welfare from development. <laughs> On that note, <laughs> thanks, Mark. <laughs> <laughs>